Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. In the previous lectures, we've talked about the Progressive Era, and some of the social movements going on at that time, and popular culture in that era. In this lecture, we turn to a discussion of politics at the presidential level, spearheaded by the two figures of Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. In 1901, at the World's Fair in Buffalo, New York, President William McKinley was shot by an assassin. It appeared at first that he would recover, and the Vice President, Theodore Roosevelt, headed out on a long-awaited hiking trip with his sons. While he was in the mountains, the condition of the President worsened, and ultimately he died. Roosevelt then learned that he was now the President of the United States on this hiking trip, and he hurried to Washington to take office. Now in the White House was one of the most dynamic, energetic, and captivating men ever to be president. He was rugged, an outdoorsman. He had established himself as a daring military presence during the Spanish-American War, a robust leader. From the time he was a young boy, he collected animals and hunted. Most of the animals he had hunted himself. And yet, he was an intellectual as well. He was a capable historian who had written massive histories of the American Navy and the American Indians. He was a commanding speaker and charismatic. At the time, he was the youngest man ever to be in the White House. Roosevelt had ascended to the presidency by becoming the most prominent politician in the most prominent state, New York. He had served as police commissioner in New York City, and later as assistant secretary of the Navy just before the Spanish-American War. He then served as governor of New York, where he increased his national profile before being chosen to be McKinley's vice president. Roosevelt was a commanding presence, and he transformed the presidency. His nephew, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who would become president in the 1930s, said that Theodore's biggest problem was that, quote, at every funeral he must be the corpse, at every wedding he must be the bride. He was the center of attention, and he transformed the presidency into the so-called bully pulpit, active seven days a week. He would be the newsmaker, the creator of the action. And yet not everyone knew what to expect of this new president. He could be stubborn and spoiled, and prior to his presidency, not everyone knew much about him. Upon hearing that Roosevelt had become president, the British foreign minister wrote, The President of the United States is a boy of twelve. This is the man who would lead the United States into the twentieth century. One story demonstrates the kind of man he was, and the kind of president he would be. Not long into his presidency, a British ambassador came to visit him at the White House. The president was just preparing to head out for a walk with his boys, and he invited the ambassador along. A simple walk turned into a brisk jog as the president and his boys bounded through the White House grounds. Without warning, they headed for the fence around the grounds and climbed over. They then ran down a few back roads until they came to the Potomac River. Roosevelt proceeded to strip off his clothes and leap in for a swim. This was the President of the United States. Roosevelt served as President from 1901 to 1909, sat out a term, then made a stirring run for another term as President in the 1912 election, which he lost. Upon becoming President, he began almost immediately to address many of the issues we've talked about over the course of this semester and the last several lectures. In 1902, Roosevelt created the Department of Labor and Commerce to help out with the issues concerning labor and the working class. We now begin to see a different way of dealing with labor in this period. You might recall issues like the homestead strike that I talked about earlier in this course. Up to this point, things had always ended badly for labor whenever there were clashes between labor and big business. 
There were various other strikes in the 1880s and 90s that had always ended badly. But now one example of a new way of handling such issues is the anthracite coal strike of 1902, which emphasizes what Roosevelt called the square deal, a fairer way of dealing with everyone. In 1902, a group of coal miners in Pennsylvania went out on strike, struggling against many of the common issues of the day in terms of working conditions and pay being cut. By October, winter was looming on the horizon, and the nation was beginning to worry about a winter without coal. Unlike as in other times in the past, Teddy Roosevelt now threatened to send in troops against management rather than against the workers. And ultimately, he appointed a commission to settle the problems working with both sides, which eventually gave some recognition to the workers and their needs. Understand, this is not a romance by any means. Labor doesn't win every dispute during this period. But they do have more recognition and more of a voice, and some of their strikes wind up having positive results during this time. During this period, at least partly as a result of Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, which we've discussed previously, we also see Roosevelt working for pure food and drug legislation. Today, we take it for granted that there are things like dates on the bottom of a can of food that we buy, or other things we purchase, that the ingredients are listed there, and there are little freshness seals that let us know when not to buy something. None of these things were around in 1900 in that era. The movement for pure food and drug legislation reached a peak in 1906 after The Jungle was published. There's an apocryphal story that Teddy Roosevelt was reading The Jungle while sitting eating his breakfast and eating a piece of sausage and then reading the passages in The Jungle that, of course, describe the kinds of things that went into the food he was eating. He decided then and there that he had to do something. Now, whether it happened exactly that way or not is something of a mystery. But we do know that Roosevelt talked to Sinclair and did work for improvements in the food industry. By 1906, there was pure food and drug legislation and a Meat Inspection Act being debated in Congress. But there were questions. Would this be government overreach? Were we heading for what we now call a welfare state? Is it really the responsibility of the federal government to protect consumers in this way? Who would be in charge of the inspections and the committees? Would they be real inspections or would they be sham inspections? One interesting point is that the businesses themselves desired at least some legislation. They wanted and needed to be inspected for a variety of reasons. In 1891, a Meat Inspection Act had been passed in Europe, and at that point, much of the product coming out of the United States could no longer be sold in Europe. So the meat companies wanted to be inspected so that they could reach the European market again. But they also wanted to have a hand in the inspections, and they didn't want any limitations to be too restrictive. The final Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 included a number of important actions. It forbid the transportation of mislabeled or adulterated food between the states. It called for inspections of the producers, which would be paid for by the government. And judicial review, in this case, favored the government, which meant that if a company was called into question, it would be closed immediately while the case was still pending. So ultimately, this act represents a compromise between the companies and the government. In the next lecture, we'll talk about other important elements of Roosevelt's presidency, including his role as the so-called trust buster and his role in the growing environmentalist movement.